Good evening, everybody. My name is Tom Johnson. I am a friend of the OBJ family. Sixteen years ago, the first Harry Middleton lecture took place in this auditorium. The next day, Lady Bird Johnson, who had established the lectureship to honor the man who was then library director, wrote to him to express her pride and her gratification that the event had been, and these were her words, a watershed day in the life of the OBJ Library. She was moved by what she felt was the chemistry that the speaker had created between himself and his audience, which was heavily composed that day by students. Contrary to the fog of cynicism and gloom, we seem as a country to have been wrapped in for some time, she wrote, the atmosphere, the chemistry of that day was so upbeat and so hopeful. The speaker that day, the creator of that chemistry, was President Jimmy Carter. President Carter returned to this library a few years later in another unforgettable appearance. He and President Gerald Ford, once foes in a political war that they had waged, met on this stage in exchange of very common discourse with a disposition to seek common ground on the issues that were confronting this nation. It was a display of the American political system at its very finest. No one who was here that day will ever forget it. And how we so need that civility and that respect for each other in the politics of today. So it is a great honor for us to welcome this splendid man back here once again. I say it from the memory of the risk, the very rich distinctions that he has already conferred on this library and this school by his visits. 39th President of the United States, winner of the Nobel Prize for Peace, a, a tireless global traveler for the cause of justice, the provider of homes for the homeless, a man who made Lady Bird Johnson proud of the lectureship she created in the name of Harry Middleton. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President Jimmy Carter. Thank you. Interviewing President Carter tonight is the outstanding new executive director of the OBJ Library. Not quite so new anymore, but a person we are delighted to have in that position. Certainly a worthy successor to Harry Middleton. Welcome Mark up to Grove. Mark. <laughs> Welcome to you. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. President. We are delighted to have you back. And you come at a very fortuitous time in the sense that I think uh, all of our minds are on what's going on in the Middle East right now. There's no one, no one U.S. president more associated with the Middle East than you. You, of course, brokered the historic 1978 peace accord between Israel and Egypt. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you view the situation in the Middle East currently. Thank you, Marcus. Good to be here again and to be in the library of a man who helped shape my life and 
for whom I have the greatest admiration and appreciation. Uh, when I was um, governor and after Lyndon Johnson left office, I wrote him a personal letter, a handwritten letter, and sent it out here. I don't know if you still have it or not, but if you don't, you might want to look it up. I don't imagine they threw it away, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you find it, I'd like a copy of it because I just hand wrote it on an airplane trip. Well, I think the Middle East uh, is still the tinderbox for the whole world. And I say that rec recognizing that there are other places that are threatening to erupt. And I include the Middle East in its totality all the way, in including uh, Lebanon, uh, not in Lebanon, of course, but also Pakistan. But I think that uh, what you referred to primarily was between Israel and its neighbors. And when I became president in ancient days, uh, there was no effort on for me to begin trying to negotiate for peace. Nobody put pressure on me. There was nothing going on. And uh, there had been four major wars in just the previous 25 years. All of them led on the Arab side by Egypt, who was then in bed with the Soviet Union. And all of Egypt's military capabilities, including 12,000 advisors, were from Russia. And of course, we were supporting Israel. So when I became president, I wanted to try to bring peace to the Holy Land, about which I had taught in my Sunday school class since I was 18 years old. And so I began to meet with the major leaders and met with Menachem Begin and others. I won't go into detail about that. But the, the finest person I ever met who was a foreign leader was Anwar Sadat. And because of Sadat's uh, courage and intelligence and generosity, we were able, as you said, Mark, to get an agreement between Israel and Egypt uh, in 1978 that Israel would withdraw from the occupied territories and give the Palestinians full autonomy and let them run their own affairs. And six months later, after intense negotiations, we had a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt in April of 1979. Not a word of which, by the way, in 32 years has ever been violated. And uh, after I left office in January, uh, involuntarily retired by the election <laughs> results of 1980, uh, Sadat and I were still close friends. And we visited him in Egypt, and, and his wife and my wife were friends, and his children and grandchildren were friends, and even our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, were friends. So we were very close to each other. And uh, in October the 8th of that year, Sadat was assassinated. Uh, Mubarak, Hosni Mubarak, was the uh, vice president and uh, immediately took office. And he was uh, Sadat's anointed successor. Since then, for 30 years or so, uh, Mubarak has chosen not to have a vice president. And although she started out as a very enlightened leader following in Sadat's footsteps, after a while, Mubarak became so infatuated with power and his family got more and more powerful in addition to him, his son, and others. And they became very rich and investing heavily in the future uh, money-making schemes in Egypt that he uh, decided not to let anybody challenge him for president. So for 30 years, you might say, they had no elements of democracy or freedom and uh, became increasingly abusive. And then, of course, came the demonstrations in Tunisia that were successful, and then they began about three weeks ago, I think yesterday, in Egypt. Uh, not organized by any particular group, not the Muslim brother, Brotherhood or anyone else, because all the political parties had been uh, kept under wraps or uh, out of existence by, by Mubarak. But they grew, and, and eventually, as you know, Mubarak was forced to leave. I don't know what's going to happen now. The Carter Center has been deeply involved in, in, in internal affairs in Israel in the uh, West Bank, in Gaza, and also in Syria, as well as Egypt, uh, for a number of years. We have full-time offices in, in those places. And I have been negotiating primarily with a man named Omar Suleiman, uh, who was chosen by Mubarak two weeks ago to be his vice president, which he had never had before. And Suleiman was head of the intelligence services for Egypt. And when I went to the Middle East, which I do several times a year, I always try to have supper or lunch with Omar Suleiman because he knows more about the Middle East than anyone else he did because he has intelligence capabilities in every country there, including spies and others. So what's going to happen now, I don't know. But as you all realize, 
that the effort by the United States to bring peace between Israel and its neighbors is completely at a stalemate. Nothing is happening. And uh, that's not an exaggeration. It's, it's completely dead in the water. Because what uh, President Obama demanded in uh, Egypt, in Cairo, shortly after being inaugurated, about ending the settlements was completely ignored uh, by the Israelis. They're madly building settlements now in all over Palestine, except for Gaza, of course, and, uh, and everything, nothing is happening. So I think that, that in the future, we'll see maybe more flexibility, at least, in dealing with the primary interest that I have, and that is bringing peace to Israel and its neighbors. Uh, the Carter Center will be involved as much as possible in helping to orchestrate another successful election in Egypt, uh, which will be their first one since Sadat's uh, death. And uh, I'll be sending a delegation over there uh, within the next week to meet with the military leaders and also the opposition to see how we can help them formulate a new constitution and also to have successful elections probably next uh, September. That may be more than you wanted to know about it, but uh, that, that's some of the things. I don't think we know enough yet. All right. We need to know. Uh, the, the Egyptian military currently holds power yes. in Egypt. Uh, and they've said that they would yield to the demo democratic process. Yes. Can we trust that the junta will, in fact, make good on their promise? They have deep economic interests in Egypt sure. and ostensibly an interest in protecting the status quo. What are your views on they do that? Well, as you know, uh, when Mubarak decided to step down, he said that Omar Suleiman, his vice president, would take over. He was, right in, he was in bed with, with Mubarak. And, and that was not satisfactory to the uh, freedom demonstrators. And so they refused. And the military has been very congenial and helpful to the demonstrators in Tahrir Square and other places. And they protected them against the very abusive uh, police and others. And so I think that many of the young people had confidence in the military in generic terms to protect them. There, was, there is a junta or a, a, a conference that the military has now. They had only met twice in history. And now I think they've met four or five times since uh, Mubarak left office. And it was their meeting together after Mubarak said he would stay in office and they passed word to Mubarak, you have to step down. And he did what the military told him. As a matter of fact, the military had been in power now for more than 50 years. Sadat was a product of the military as well as NASA before him. So the military will be in charge of Egypt's security and a lot of other factors in Egypt in the future. My guess is that the military leaders don't want to give up their political influence or power. But they have seen what the demonstrators have done, and I think the demands of the demonstrators will not permit the military to keep charge of the political situation. They'll still be in charge of the military. They still have a lot of um, financial investments in the various aspects of Egyptian life, but I don't think have any doubt much that the, uh, that the demonstrators will not accept anything except uh, honest and fair and open elections with the formation of political parties permitted for the first time and maybe a competitive election, both for the parliament of uh, Egypt and also for the presidency. As you know, yesterday, I believe, the military junta dissolved the parliament, which was elected under Mubarak's leadership without any real opposition except for his own political party. So I believe it has a, is a good chance now that the military, despite the fact that they would rather stay in power, will give up political power, uh, that is, with honest elections and freedom for the people uh, the rest of this year. Mr. President, how should we view the Muslim Brotherhood? I've known members of the Muslim Brotherhood because when I go to Egypt and other places, I try to meet with all the political uh, people. And, and they have uh, played a, a small role. They are well organized. Uh, they have ties to Hezbollah in, uh, in Lebanon and also to Hamas, uh, whose headquarters are in uh, uh, in Syria, in Damascus, but who also have ties with uh, Gaza. They control Gaza. I think that the Muslim Brotherhood are not anything to be afraid of in the upcoming political situation or evolution that I see as most likely, because they will be subsumed in the overwhelming uh, demonstration of de desire for freedom and true democracy, and I would say a secular or non